Hi folks, this is Dr. Rob Sivers. I am the uh, Carb Addiction Doc and today we're totally going to nerd out. So for those of you that are interested in chemistry and human biology and physiology, uh, listen up. This is going to get very technical. It's going to be a deep dive into something. We're going to talk today about something you may have heard a lot about because it's been bandied around and most people don't really understand this very well. And it's called the Randall cycle, R-A-N-D-L-E cycle, named after Philip Randall, who is a uh, biochemistry and physiology professor uh, way back in the 1950s and 60s. So, uh, and you'll hear a lot about the Randall cycle and it's invoked in a whole bunch of things. But the other cool thing, as I researched this, as I got to understand it, and as I got to understand what the concept is, and I'm not pro or against this at all. I'm not, oh, this, is, this is, explains everything. No, this is completely wrong. It is absolutely valid in physiology because it is science research. It is not epidemiology. It's basic science research. But it is also a very, very cool journey down the evolution of scientific understanding. And even now today, we are in, uh, learning more about the same process because all the all the knowledge isn't there. So Philip Randall uh, wrote this wonderful paper um, with the knowledge he had at the time that he wrote it. And so much more of the questions and the understanding have been fleshed out as our knowledge has, gained, has been gained over the last little while. And I'm going to share that with you. So I've heard a lot of talk uh, from people, oh, the Randall cycle explains this and it's fat that causes diabetes and all the causal bullshit that you know I rail against. Because this is just explaining part of how the body works, but it's explaining how the body works without all the knowledge. So here's the key thing. When I hear about these kinds of things, when I hear about someone's simplistic explanation of something, and I would urge all of you to do this because this is going to be a complex explanation, but it's not going to give you all the answers. So go back to the roots, go back to the original articles, and, and this is what I did. So right here, let's start with what the Randall cycle is. Here's the original paper, okay? In, uh, in the Lancet, the, one of the most prestigious medical journals uh, in the world, Saturday the 13th of April, 1963, 59 years ago, Philip Randall and his group at the University of Cambridge uh, Department of Biochemistry wrote a summary paper and it's the glucose fatty acid cycle, its role in insulin sensitivity and the metabolic disturbances of diabetes mellitus. Now that's type 1 diabetes. So we were trying to identify what contributes to diabetes. Now I didn't say one or two because those things, those terms didn't really exist in 1963. They didn't exist. They didn't know about those two. They were just looking at diabetes. And it's the glucose fatty acid cycle. So let's dig into the science of this. And I've actually learned quite a lot from this. So it's really cool to understand. We're going to first look at um, glucose and then at fat and then kind of put the two together. So if you look at a cell and, and what the, where the Randall cycle works predominantly is in and what they study was muscle cells. So skeletal muscle, striated muscle cells, and heart muscle cells. Those are the muscle cells that they looked at. And the muscle cells have unique utilization and biology and a need for energy. So the way the muscle cells work is they are independent cell structures. They have uh, on them a receptor for insulin that allows sugar to enter the cell. And fat, various forms of fat, and fat comes in kind of three forms. Uh, or four forms. Fatty acids, which are individual strands, long strands of fat. Um, medium chain triglycerides, which are shorter chains of fat that are water soluble. And ketones, which are ultra short uh, uh, fatty acid chains that are also water soluble. And then triglycerides. And triglycerides are three, three chains of fat attached with a glycerol molecule a little sugar-like molecule that is water-soluble, that's the way fat gets to the cell and then the fat can enter the cell. So fat can travel free in the bloodstream or in a molecule called LDL and that enters the muscle cells. So fat can enter across the membrane because the membrane is made of fat or sugar has to enter the muscle cells through some sort of a transport, energy requiring transport molecule. Most in the, in the, in the, Muscle cells regulated by a GLUT4 receptor for insulin. 
It's a specific type of insulin receptor. Now, so that's how, that's how the sugar gets into the cell. And here's the cool part. When sugar gets into the cell, it can also leave the cell. However, very rapidly, a, an enzyme called um, phosphofructokinase, PFK, adds a phosphate molecule to glucose. So you get something called glucose 1-phosphate. So on the first carbon molecule, you get attachment of phosphate, and that traps the sugar in the muscle cell. Different cells work, work differently. Um, the liver is the only place we've got bidirectional flow of, G6, uh, of, of uh, G1 phosphate. However, glucose enters the cell, could leave, but gets trapped there by um, PFK adding a phosphate molecule. And that phosphate molecule traps the glucose molecule in the cell. Now, that glucose 1-phosphate molecule is living in the cytoplasm, in the general fluid inside the cell. And one of two things can happen to that glucose molecule. The first thing is, in the muscle cell, we know that the muscle cells, when they're quiescent, will store glycogen. And glycogen is, think of it as glucose molecules being individual molecules and glycogen being a chain of molecules. And um, the conversion of glucose to glycogen can occur in these cells. Okay, glycogenolysis, the formation of glycogen. So some of that G61 phosphate, oh sorry, G1 phosphate, glucose 1-phosphate molecule goes toward glycogen and gets stored as sugar in the cell that can then be mobilized during physical activity. The second pathway is for that glucose molecule to be converted in the, in the cytosol, in the plasma, to something called pyruvate, which is a breakdown product of glucose releasing a little bit of energy, and then that pyruvate molecule enters the mitochondria, and the mitochondria are the factory, uh, the little organelles, the little factory where energy gets released. You've heard of the Krebs cycle or the tricarboxylic acid cycle, where uh, glucose or pyruvate goes to be turned into ATP. So that glucose can either go directly into the mitochondria and become ATP or energy that can be used by the cell for function, or it can be stored inside the cell as glycogen, but it gets trapped there by G61. So the three rate limiting steps of glucose entry into the cell is number one, the provision of glucose in the bloodstream. So there's a concentration of glucose. Number two, the presence of insulin that allows the sugar to enter the cell and therefore the receptor, the insulin receptor, the GLUT4 receptor has to be working to allow the sugar to enter the cell. Then the sugar has to be trapped there by phosphorylation, by PFK, and then it can either be triaged to energy or triaged to glycogen uh, storage within the cell. Okay, that is the pathway. And we'll look at how that pathway gets affected. The other pathway, and this is the, the interesting thing about muscle cells, is the other pathway is the pathway of fat. So we get non-esterified fatty acids, these single long chains of fat. We get triglycerides, three chains of fat with glycerol. And we get MCT and ketones that can all enter the cell. Now, in order for um, triglycerides to enter the cell, the glycerol backbone has to be broken off. So basically what's entering the cell, whether it comes from triglycerides or free fatty acids bound to albumin, is a long chain of fat or ketones or MCT, shorter chains of fat that enter the cell, again, in the cell fluid. And in the cell fluid, that little bit of fat can either be stored, so the muscle cells themselves have fat in them, or that fat, so... There are two names of processes for fat in the cell. And the uh, fat can either be esterified in the cell. And the esterification of fat allows the fat to be stored as a droplet of fat in the, fats in the muscle cell. The muscle cells cannot form new fat. Fat cells can turn sugar into fat. The muscle cells cannot form new fat, but they can store fat as a fatty droplet. So if you're eating a big steak, especially if you eat lamb, you'll see that the, the, the meat actually has a little uh, a fat within the meat. Okay? So that's esterification where it gets stored as fat. Uh, just like the glucose can be stored as glycogen, the esterification process stores that fat as fat. Or 
the fat can go, the non-esterified fatty acid can go through a process called oxidation, where it gets transformed at first in the cytosol to malonolic acid, and, and then it can go into the, into the mitochondria, just like glucose does. And the ox what the word oxidation means, it gets broken down to energy. And it's exactly the same process, whether it is sugar or whether it is um, the fatty acid that's being broken down in that chain, entering the Krebs cycle, the production of energy is exactly the same in the mitochondria. Okay? So we've got two separate energy structures. Think of it as fat being one, which can be stored or used for energy, glucose being another one, glucose being used or stored as energy. Now, here's the key thing to understand, and this is what the Randall cycle is all about, and what they studied is they, because all they had were these substrates, they had insulin, they knew about insulin from the diabetes days, from Banting and Best's work in the 1910s, and they knew about fat, and they knew about glycerol, and they knew about sugar, glucose. They didn't know anything else. And that's very important. In 1963, they did not have knowledge of anything else. So when they studied these muscle cells in culture, so they grew the muscle cells in a Petri dish, and they, they influenced them by various things. So one of the things they did is they, they didn't provide insulin, or they created diabetes, uh, type 1 diabetes, by using a particular, in animals, a particular uh, uh, toxin that killed the insulin-producing cells. Okay? Um, and, and what they did then is they also used growth hormone, they used cortisol, they used a variety of different hormones uh, that they did know about to see what influenced these cells. And what they found is the following. They found, number one, that muscle cells preferentially prefer to metabolize non-esterified fatty acids. So when you have adequate supply of fatty acids or of ketones or of fat to the cell, and it's an otherwise healthy cell, irrespective of insulin, the preferential pathway is to use that fat as the primary source of energy for the muscle. The fat preferentially goes into the mitochondria and becomes ATP. And it's, that's a very, if anybody out there is an athlete, that is such a crucially important thing to understand, is that the muscle cells preferentially use fat, and fat is mostly available between meals. And if you are going long periods of time, like we did in the 1960s, where we didn't snack all day long, we were going long periods of time eating two, maybe three meals a day, those long periods of time, fat was dominant in our bloodstream, the fat cells were releasing fat into the bloodstream, Fat was floating in the bloodstream, either attached to albumin or being transported by LDL that they did not know about. But the fat came to the cells and the liver was producing ketones and muscle cells, heart muscle cells, heart muscle cells and striated muscle cells preferentially use non-esterified fatty acids as their source of energy. In fact, there's another paper which was subsequently published in 1985, I believe, that looked at the different types of energy used by the, by the heart muscle. And we know that, about, that the heart muscle, everybody's heart muscle, you, about 85% of the energy to the heart muscle is non-esterified fatty acids. So that's preferential. What, what the Randall cycle showed is that when fat is available and glucose is available, the fat in high concentration pushes the glucose away from the mitochondrion toward glycogen uh, uh, formation. So when you have a lot of fat available to the muscle cell and there's sugar available, the sugar is not primarily used as an energy source, the fat is preferentially used, and the glucose is stored as glycogen. So between meals, we replenish, we replenish, we get glycogen, glucose into the cell under the influence of insulin, and that glucose gets stored as glycogen, gets stored as glycogen even when there, when there is fat available. And only when there is less fat available do we then use glucose to go into the mitochondrion to be used as, as energy primarily, or we then mobilize the glycogen toward energy. So that's very, very important to understand. The other very interesting thing to understand, and this is important about muscles, and especially about exercise, is that 
When there's a lot of sugar and there's fat available, the fat preferentially goes through the mitochondrion. Some of the glucose goes to glycogen, but when that glycogen is full, when there's a lot of glycogen, some of the glucose goes down toward the pyruvate pathway in the cytosol. So you're breaking the glucose down, ready to go into the mitochondrion. But if the fat is going to the mitochondrion, that pyruvate and a, a subsidiary of pyruvate is something called lactate that everyone un uh, understands. We pre the glucose stops. The metabolism of glucose stops at pyruvate and stops at lactate and then the pyruvate and the lactate can then leave the cell and go back to the liver where it can be repackaged into glucose. So there's a cycling. Excess sugar in the cell goes to pyruvate and lactate and goes back to the, um, uh, back to the liver and can be packaged, repackaged as glucose. The, the heart, for example, the heart muscle, about 2% of the energy that the heart uses is lactate. So it can use lactate as a form of energy, but a very, very small fraction. But all the muscle prefers to use fat, and that is so, so important. So um, under conditions of diabetes or starvation, where we have very low carbohydrate consumption, any uh, carbohydrate consumption, any sugar that is in the bloodstream gets stored in the liver, uh, at least in the in the muscle cells, as glycogen. But the but the, the the muscle cell itself becomes very fat dominant. It's using ketones. It's using non-esterified fatty acids as its primary fuel source. And that is also true under conditions of human growth hormone and cortisol or Cushing's. When human growth hormone levels are high or cortisol is high, or if you're starving. If you haven't eaten for a long time, fasting is really the, the process. Or under conditions of type 1 diabetes where you don't have insulin, you cannot get that sugar to enter the cell and therefore you are using fat, non-esterified fatty acids, as your primary fuel source. However, what Philip Randall then said is he then assigned causality. And he said that increased non-esterified fatty acids to the cell and in the cell in the bloodstream causes a decrease in glucose utilization through the pyruvate pathway. So an increase in non-esterified fatty acids causes abnormal carbohydrate metabolism. And that, folks, is false. It's associated with but not causal too. And he caused that, he called that the fatty acid syndrome. And here's where his thinking and his ability to assign causality in the Randall cycle is erroneous. Because when I read this paper, the first thing I thought is, okay, I understand what he's saying. And what he's saying makes absolute plausible sense. But what are the conditions that cause the high fat, and what are the conditions that prevent the sugar from getting into the cell or being used by the cell? What are those conditions? And the first thing, when I looked at the original paper, and I saw that it's 1963, a long time ago, long time ago, I went back and looked at, okay, the second thing I, I realized as I read this is all of these functions seem like they're driven by glucagon. Glucagon is a hormone. Glucagon increases blood sugar by releasing sugar from the liver, releasing glycogen stores from the liver. Glucagon releases fat, causes lipolysis, releases esterified and non-esterified fatty acids from the fat cells. Glucagon is responsible for the reduction of ketones. So glucagon increases ketone levels, increases non-esterified fatty acid levels, and also slightly may increase uh, glucose levels, or at least provide some glucose at very, very low levels in the bloodstream. That's a glucagon uh, effect. And glucagon also has effects in the cell by shutting down, by shutting down the conversion of sugar to fat in the fat cells, and also by triaging, by triaging glucose to pyruvate and glucose to glycogen and prevents glucose from entering the mitochondria in certain cells. Those are glucagon effects. So for what Philip Randall is assigning to not the functions of non-esterified fatty acids is causing glucose dysmetabolism is actually a glucagon function. Actually a glucagon function. And in a healthy normal person, glucagon and insulin should operate inversely. 
So as glucagon levels go down, insulin goes up. And what causes that? High blood sugar. So when your blood sugar is high, insulin should be high to clear the sugar, to turn the sugar into fat and to get it stored as glycogen. When insulin levels are low, glucagon should be high. But if you don't have insulin, type 1 diabetes, cortisol, growth hormone, if the insulin is low, glucagon is going to be functioning even when you're eating. So when a diabetic eats and they eat carbohydrates, there's no insulin to clear it. So glucagon is still functional. So under those conditions, it may seem that the non-esterified fatty acids are controlling glucose. The fact is, and this is what Philip Randall didn't know, that either in the absence of, of insulin or under a condition he was even unfamiliar with called type 2 diabetes, insulin resistance occurs. And why did he not know about insulin resistance? Because he did not know of the existence of two very important structures. He did not know of the existence of a hormone called glucagon. And he did not know of the existence of an energy-dependent insulin, uh, um, uh, insulin receptor called the GLUT4 receptor that in muscle cells allow sugar to enter the cells under the influence of insulin. See, folks, first simplistically, the GLUT4 receptor was only discovered in 1988. 1988. And the GLUT4 receptor occurs in two tissues. It occurs in muscle cells, striated muscle cells, heart cells and muscle cells. And the GLUT4 receptor exists in adipose tissue to allow, under the influence of insulin, sugar to enter the cell. And if the GLUT4 receptor is broken as it is in insulin resistance, then that pathway is screwed up. Philip Randall did not understand that. He did not have knowledge of that because he had no knowledge of the GLUT4. Now, credit to Philip Randall, he made the assumption, he made a beautiful assumption that there must be a, an abnormal regulation in certain people of glucose entry into the cell. So Philip Randall did something beautiful. He postulated, he actually uh, uh, um, intentionally stated that the three levels of, of damage are number one, glucose entry across the membrane. So he talked about the GLUT4 receptor without ever knowing of its existence. He then also postulated that another rate limiting step of this pathway, whether the mitochondria are using fat or sugar, is determined by the conversion of glucose to uh, glucose 1-phosphate by the, um, uh, by the uh, phosphofructokinase enzyme. And we know absolutely that that's true as well, that that PFK enzyme is affected by ATP-AMP ratio. And if you can't trap the glucose as G61P, then the glucose can come and go. And then the other part that he didn't understand was the triaging towards glycogen versus the pyruvate lactate pathway. But he postulated, he, he speculated that those three mechanisms, that those three levels of obstruction were the problem. However, let's look at glucagon. What's the history of glucagon? Well, glucagon was first described in a pancreatic extract in 1922. So in 1922, a group of, uh, of physicians written up by Kimball and Muslin, they extracted some pancreas, created this emulsification of pancreas. Remember, this is shortly after the molecule insulin was, was described. And um, what they found is that in diabetics, in type 1 diabetics, when they added this emulsion to uh, a type 1 diabetic, and they didn't know what it was, just mush of pancreas, blood sugar went up. So glucagon was releasing that blood sugar and ketones went up. So they were able to isolate this hormone, some, something in the pancreas. In 1959, at Eli Lilly, they were able to isolate the molecule glucagon. So they were able to isolate the molecule glucagon from the pancreas by electrophoresis. So Eli Lilly, in their labs, isolated this in 1959. And uh, after this, from 1959 to 1965, a guy by the name of Roger Unger was able to create a test for glucagon. So we could now test for glucagon, okay? But only in 1976, only in 1976 was a radioimmunoassay developed for glucagon. And only then, after 1976, were we able to understand and test what glucagon does. Folks, 
The Randall paper. Philip Randall wrote his paper in 1963. 1963. And some of the cool things that, that um, Randall wrote in his paper in terms of glucagon. He wrote here, let me find it for you. Uh, it, it's really cool what he did. He said, moreover, there are several differences between the insulin insensitivity induced in muscle by fatty acids in these experiments and the insulin antagonism observed with albumin preparations by Valence Owen and Lilly, 1959. They are therefore unlikely to be the same. So here's the cool part. In the lab, Philip Randall took albumin and attached fatty acids to them without having the pancreatic emulsion available. When you had the pancreatic emulsion available, it changed the context because glucagon was in that emulsion. But he didn't know that. He didn't know the existence of glucagon, so he blew that off. And when you blow off glucagon and glucagon doesn't exist, then it's obvious that the non-esterified fatty acids themselves were having this effect. And that's how he was able to erroneously assign causality to the, to the Randall cycle. But he didn't know about it and he blew it off. In particular, the effects of fatty acids are much smaller and are seen in the absence of added insulin in vitro. So that's what he said. So he did not know of the existence of glucagon. Once you understand glucagon, the functions of glucagon, it is so obvious that this entire mechanism does exist and the preference of muscle cells for fat and fatty acids is true. But it's influenced by glucagon. Glucagon is causal. And abnormalities of glucagon and insulin balance and glucagon and insulin negative feedback, when that system is broken, is causal to insulin resistance. It's a hormonal problem, not a substrate problem. So the Randall cycle is absolutely true and every athlete should understand the Randall cycle because that's why fat is important. Fat is more important than sugar when you're exercising and it's better to exercise under glucagon with the release of those fatty acids, the production of ketones, the production and release of, of sugar than it is to exercise under insulin, insulin because you've triggered it with carb cycling. That is absolutely true. But the controlling, the regulating uh, hormone is glucagon, not fatty acids themselves. So I love the fact that Randall was able to deduce this. I mean, his mind is just brilliant in terms of able to predict stuff. But he couldn't predict the truth and he made the mistake of causality because he didn't know about glucagon. And when he says a causal relationship, he didn't no, he overstepped his boundaries. So as we look at this a little bit further, his cycle is that non-esterified fatty acids decrease the conversion of glucose to pyruvate and entry into the uh, mitochondrial cycle. So it's competitive. And the non-esterified fatty acids win in terms of energy production. But then as the glucose concentration in the cell uh, increases, it decreases the non-esterified fatty acid cycle uh, particularly when more glycogen is formed, and then glucose gets used. So it is a competitive feedback cycle driven by the non-esterified fatty acids. And he says that the uptake of glucose is blocked by ketones and the release of non-esterified fatty acids. That's what he said, but he didn't take into consideration the, co the concept of glucagon because he didn't know about glucagon. And his mistake, Randall's mistake, was that he made his assessments independent of hormonal control. So if we're going to understand the Randall cycle, it is absolutely true at a cellular level. But the puppeteer, the, 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 the string puller, is the relationship between glucagon and insulin and these other hormones, cortisol, human growth hormone, those all influence it. But it's really insulin and glucagon are the primary hormones. And if that mechanism is working properly in a negative feedback system, the Randall cycle is true. If that system is broken, the Randall system is broken, and then because of that broken hormonal state, you get the various dysfunctions at a cellular level, primarily insulin resistance and paradoxical hyperglucagonemia, where glucagon is in excess despite high blood sugar because you can't clear the sugar into the cells, and the cells are running at a glucose deficit, running on ketones and fat because they don't have adequate glucose entry, even though glucagon is providing high levels of sugar to the bloodstream. And that is where 
Randall made his mistake. But what Randall didn't understand is that the concentration of glucagon is increased in insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes, along with the increase of ketones and non-esterified fatty acids, mostly non-esterified fatty acids. And the tissue prefers ketones and non-esterified fatty acids, and glucose is only a secondary fuel source. That is so, so important. And that is really the message of the Randall cycle. But it doesn't explain that fat causes diabetes. And people that say that did not go back and look at the history and the conditions under which Randall said what he said. Because fat does not cause diabetes. Fat does not cause diabetes. Fat is necessary in the face of insulin resistance. Because at a cellular level, there isn't adequate glucose entering the muscle cell. And it's a glucose deficiency because of insulin resistance in the cell that makes fat the preferential molecule. And Randall didn't understand that because he did not know of glucagon. That, folks, is the beauty of physiology. Knock holes in this, knock holes in this, but do your reading. I love the Randall cycle. It is absolutely correct, but there are other influences. There are other influences. And we've got to look at the big human picture to understand how the body works. But ultimately, ultimately, when it comes to insulin resistance, it is caused by chronic excessive carbohydrate consumption, but perseverated by chronic excessive glucose production. Wow. Final little blowing of the mind. When you're insulin resistant and you are hyperglucagonemic, you're producing a lot of glucagon, even in the face of high blood sugar, your liver continues to produce both ketones and excess blood sugar. Because glucagon is not influenced anymore by insulin. It's not controlled. So you have this massive sugar plus this release of fat. And that's where the cells struggle. So even if you're on a ketogenic diet, even if you're on a pure carnivore diet, your liver early on can still produce excess sugar, can still produce under the influence of glucagon excess sugar. Why is my blood sugar not getting better? And it's because of the Randall cycle, folks. It's because of the Randall cycle. That's why a pure carnivore who's eating a lot of protein, excess protein, has high blood sugar because of the Randall effect. And then that sugar has to come back to the liver and be stored as fat. And that is not human healthy. So the goal here is to increase insulin, uh, insulin sensitivity, even on our carnivores, and not be insulin suppressed. And I know that that will blow a lot of your minds. But understand that even on a carnivore diet, the Randall cycle is still true. Leave questions. I'm sure there's going to be more questions than answers. Don't just knee jerk. Uh, uh, oh, you're wrong. You're wrong. You're wrong. Understand the science. Understand the timeline. Understand the history. That's what gets my juices flowing. And folks, we're in exactly the same situation right now. We know about insulin. We know about glucagon. Here's what we don't know about. We don't know about GLP-1 and the other incretins. We know they exist, but we really don't know how they influence this whole biology. At the end of my lifetime, we're going to slowly understand this because GLP-1 to me is what glucagon was to Randall, a new discovery, a new insight. And we will change our understanding and improve our knowledge and improve our physiologic understanding of the human body as we understand the interplay with these crucial incretins that we've blown off for such a long time. We've known about them for decades. We've never understood what they did or what the influence was, particularly the influence on blood sugar, on glucagon, and on insulin. So the next chapter is yet to be written. But that, folks, is the Randall, Randall cycle nerding out, spacing out. True, but small because it's encapsulated without the broader knowledge. Love to talk to people further about this. Explore, explore, explore.
but don't assign causality of diabetes to fat. It is false. And that's where Randall made his mistake because of a lack of knowledge. I am the carb addiction doc. If I've blown your mind, if this was too much for you, hey, that's fine. It wasn't for everybody. I understand that. Don't eat sugar, eat fat. <laughs> if you know that, you know what to do. I'll talk to you next time. And I'll answer some of your questions as best I can.